Kia ora koutou and welcome to the third in our Science Live live streaming events from Te Papa. My name's Ruth, I'm part of the web team here. Uh, and I'm Scott, I'm an educator at Te Papa. And today we're live from the classroom here at our museum building uh, at in Wellington. And we're behind the scenes looking at some of the research that happens here at Te Papa. Uh, so lots of hands-on uh, research happens here uh, in, the, in to do with the natural environment. Um, and our scientists are always doing research, analysing and writing up data uh, on the natural environment. That's right. So we're here from the Level 4 classroom, which is one of the buildings in Te Papa where lots of education workshops take place. And in this uh, live stream, we'll be taking you behind the scenes to learn how you can use science to make discoveries on your summer holidays. Because whilst you're out and about on New Zealand's coastline, you'll be able to discover it's full of life. Yeah, that's right. New Zealand's a very long, thin country with lots of coast. Um, so there's very few places that are uh, very much of a distance from the coast. Yeah, that's right. It's very long and also it's very convoluted. So it twists and turns, making lots of little bays and coves. And also don't forget about the fjords and the sounds. Yeah, that's exactly right. And not only is it long, it's also very diverse. So you get lots of types of coastline and they merge from kind of craggy cliffs, cliffs up on the edge of the sea all the way down to sandy shores. That's right. And as well, New Zealand stretches from the subtropics up in the Kermadex right down to subantarctic islands um, further south than Stewart Island. So we've got a lot of coast and also a lot of coastal life. And this coastal life is very diverse too. There's a huge range of species you can find, for plants and animals. And lots of these species have interesting adaptations. And these adaptations help them to live successfully in very diverse environments. So what's the most interesting thing you've seen recently at the beach? I think recently it would be um, down on the south coast of New Zealand where I saw a few seals playing in the waves. Oh, that's cool. I saw off the coast of Wellington recently, I saw an octopus for the first time, which was very exciting. Indeed, it sounds a lot more exciting than my seal, I think. <laughs> I, don't, I haven't seen an octopus before. <laughs> um, so we're going to have some of our scientists here um, talking through some of the interesting things you might see at the coast uh, over the summer holidays here in New Zealand. Yep, yeah, that's right. And you can ask these scientists your questions. So if there's a coastal creature you'd really like to know about, ask your questions either via Twitter using the hashtag ScienceLiveTapapa, via email using the email address ScienceLive at tapapa.govt.nz or via the blog comments as well. And remember to get your questions in quickly so we've got a chance to answer them during the broadcast. That's right. Thanks very much, Scott. So we're going to say goodbye to Scott now and here to hopefully answer some of your questions and also tell us a little bit more about the creatures you can find at the beach is Rick Weber. Now he's a curator of crustacea, a coastal biologist and also a tapapa scientist. So very quickly, Rick, before we get into all these lovely specimens here, can you tell me a little bit about your work? Yes, I can. Um, basically, I, I study crustaceans. That's my specialty, mostly crabs and shrimps and prawns. And uh, my particular area of interest there is their larvae. That's the babies that actually they lay from eggs under their tails which go out into the sea and uh, live their lives there until they become adults themselves. Ah, that sounds really interesting. But before we delve too deeply into that, Scott and I briefly touched on the different types of coast that you can find in New Zealand. Would you be able to tell us a bit more about those? Yes, there are. There are all sorts of different kinds of coasts, as you, as you mentioned. But... Um, they can be classified into fairly major different kinds. One kind is rocky coasts, of course, and that's where you get cliffs, you get crags, you get uh, ledges, fissures, cracks in the rock and so on, which is a great place for both animals and, and, um, and uh, seaweeds to live. And, and there you get a great variety of species. Okay, and then what? Second, well, a second category there is boulder beaches, or gravelly beaches that are in, on open coasts and they actually have the boulders and stones move with the waves and the currents and that's not a very good place to live. Quite only a few kinds of animals and seaweeds are there. A third category of course is sandy beaches. We have mm. hundreds, thousands of kilometres of sandy beaches on the open coasts that everyone will be familiar with. We also have hundreds, probably thousands of bays that are sandy. Our fourth and final one is pretty familiar to most of us because it's the mud flats and sand flats that you see in sheltered harbours and in the mouths of rivers, the estuaries of rivers. Yeah, And those are four major kinds of um, shore that 
we can recognise. Mm. So out of those four habitat types, where do you think the most amount of species would live? Well, I would say the most species live on rocky shores because of the, just the sheer variety of places that they, they can live in. Mm. Um, there's, there, there's that side of it, so there's the greatest bio, bio, biodiversity there. It's mm. the muddy shores where really you, you have fewer species, but some of those species are huge in number, vast in number. And one that's familiar to most people is probably cockles. Mm. There, the hectares of cockles live right alongside each other, just below the surface of the sandy mud. And uh, even though you don't see them there, they're just there in millions. Yeah. So it sounds like the rocky shore would be a really good place for people to start exploring so they can find a lot of different species. Now, you mentioned four types of coastal habitat, but what about the water? That must be hugely important. The water is important, of course. And one of the basic obvious things about shorelines is that we get tides. So the tide comes into the high tide mark and it goes out to the low tide mark. And that means that animals and seaweeds that live between the tides are, are some of the time they're covered by water, seawater, some of the time they're not. So they are subject to sun, wind, fresh water when it's raining. They're subject to the waves pounding them if they're on open beaches. And so it's a pretty tough place to live, but there are still, there's still a great variety of um, life forms between the tides as well as below and above. I guess the changing conditions and also the sheer diversity of species must make it quite a challenging place to do research. Changing conditions certainly do. That makes for a very complicated habitat for these um, things. Uh, and yes, and um, the there well. Um, if we think of ourselves, we belong to a particular phylum. We're the phylum with animals with, back, with backbones, along with seals and birds and so on. Uh, and that's just one phylum. There are besides, and that phylum is chordata, but there are besides the chordata about 30-something other phyla of animals, and they're all invertebrates, so they don't have backbones. That is a beginning just to see how complicated life is. The shores actually have dozens of phylums represented on them. And you've got some of these phyla here to show us, but just before we go into that, could you explain to our audience what exactly a phyla is? Because some of them might not know what that means. A phylum is simply a very high level on the family tree, on the tree of life, which uh, has animals or plants related uh, by certain things like a backbone. So it's the same... explain that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because, yeah, okay. Mm. It's essentially a unit of life, I guess, is that what you're saying? It's a large unit of life, yes. Yes, indeed it is, yeah. Which, which differs very significantly from the next unit of life. Okay, great, thank you. And you've got some of these phyla here to show us, and these are all species that, if you're on your summer holidays in New Zealand, you might come across them in the various types of habitat. Yes, yes I have, and proud. I'll actually just go through them. I've got them all, got some of them represented here on the table, just the major ones, the ones that people are actually likely to see when they go to the shore. Well, for a start, we have the mollusks. That's a phylum, of course. Um, the one, this line down here is of mollusks that live on rocky shores. And so we have chitons, we have limpets and other snail types. And then we, of course, we have bivalves as well. These are common mussels that most people will know about. On sandy shores, open sandy shores and sheltered ones, we have quite a few different bivalve shells like these here. Uh, generally, they live at the towards the bottom of the beach and out beyond the low tide mark, buried in the sand. There are also a few snails, typical snails. This one here particularly, which is called an ostrich foot, is very common on our open beaches and uh, most people will have found them at some point. On muddy shores and muddy sandy shores, we get these kinds here. We still get some bivalves. We also get these carnivorous snails. As I mentioned before, we've got um, we have cockles, that's a typical cockle. Uh, this kind of uh, snail as well, and mud oysters as well. So just before we go on, those little snails there, they're actually tiny snails that eat meat, is that right? They are, and when you get an, when you expose a bivalve or something on the beach between the tides, you see them come from a surprising distance, and they all focus in on it, and they cover whatever the prey is, and by the time they go back home, it's gone, except for a clean shell. So they're great. They're very, 
voracious eaters, <laughs> yeah. A second uh, phylum is sponges. Sponges are, I only have this one example of a sponge now, and there's a, there's a thing called a holdfast. Sponges have to have solid, solid surfaces to attach to, so that you find most of those in rocky, on rocky shores. A third phylum is the echinoderms, and the echinoderms are starfish and kinners. There's another small cushion star that you're quite likely to see in rock pools. This is common on rocky coasts around central New Zealand and most of New Zealand. This is a kinner, of course, that, is a, that lives on rock. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it, they only live on rock. They graze algae. They're a little bit like, um, like sheep, I suppose, grazing <laughs> the green algae on the short green algae on rock surfaces. Brittle stars, you'll find those, that's that one there, you'll find those um, in rock pools or particularly under rocks that you lift. These are snapper biscuits, otherwise known as, as um, sand dollars. They live on sandy shores and they've, they've got thousands of tiny little prickles on them and they get covered in sand. You can never see them until you actually dig them out. These ones here are heart urchins and they live in mud. They actually burrow along in muddy places like estuaries and harbours to um, and process the mud a little bit like worms do to get their food. Another phylum is the Nideria. The only example I've got of that is this model of a beadlet anemone. A couple of beadlet anemones, one closed, one open. They're the most common that you will find. They live on rocky shores. Again, they need to attach themselves to something. Um, yeah, they're pretty common on rocks, particularly in those cracks where they can keep wet and in the, in the half dark out of the sun. Another phylum, which people probably don't hear about very often, but which is incredibly common, is uh, the bryozoa. And the bryozoa build themselves, they are colonial animals, and they build themselves these structures. Now this looks a little bit like hair, perhaps it looks a little bit like seaweed and is probably mistaken for it. But all those little threads there have tiny little, more or less microscopic little uh, places in them with hinged doors that the animal, individual animals actually live in. And they open the door to feed and they close the door to protect themselves. And there will be thousands of them just in that bunch of threads. They are like so many of the others, they need a hard thing to attach to. So this one here, instead of attaching to a rock, has actually attached itself to a muscle, a dead muscle shell. But it's been a pretty good place to live. So just to clarify, and that's not actually a seaweed, that's it made up of lots and lots of small animals. Indeed it is. Yeah, it's a colony of animals. Yeah. And these colonies that are great variety of species in our waters alone and a lot of them are between the tides or below the low tide. Very common, just mistaken for seaweeds most of the time I think. Here's something that uh, people may see if they go to the beach, pieces of this, of this um, lace coral. That's another, the, that also has these little, little homes in it with the little hinged doors, it's just that it's a hard skeleton that they live in. Another phylum, worms. Well, worms are more than one phylum, phyla, but this one here, this one we have here, which I hope you can see, that's a rather big polychaete worm. Polychaete worms have bristles down on each side and they use those bristles to move about. That one's in preservative, so it's lost its colour. Um, when it's alive, it actually is very, it's all colours the rainbow. It's rather, rather beautiful things. They live burrowing in mud or sand, they live under rocks in, on the rocky shore, they live among seaweeds as well. So they live in a variety of places. Worms are very common. You get polychaete worms, round worms, and different kinds of worms. That so they're a bit are like the earthworms that people might see in their gardens, except these ones are brightly coloured? Yeah, they are, but they, they, they do differ in quite considerably uh, from the ones in the garden, but they are worms as well, and you get close relatives of those in the, along the shores as well, yep. And of course my favourite um, phylum, which is the, the, which is the arthropoda, and, and of course the marine representatives of the arthropoda are the crustacea, which are crabs, shrimps, I have a shrimp there, lobster, lobsters, and 
also sand hoppers, slaters and so on, and of course barnacles. Whether you b realize it or not, barnacles are also crustaceans, but they live attached to rock and hard surfaces. And they'll be very familiar on the, sh on the rocky shore because uh, there are millions of them there making whole covers. Yes. So your work, as you said, is studying crustacea and you've got some lovely examples here. We've got crabs, we've got barnacles, we've got lobsters and shrimp. But the main bulk of your work, as you mentioned earlier, is studying larvae or the baby crustacea. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, yes, yes. Um, baby crustacea, almost all crabs and lobsters have lays tiny little eggs and they, when the eggs are laid by the female, she keeps them under the, her abdomen. If it's a lobster under here, abdomen being the tail, another word for it. And in this case here, we've got this crab here. Believe it or not, that's a crab. It's a masking crab, so it's covered in weed and so on. But under that tail is a mass of thousands of little tiny, tiny little eggs. She keeps those there until it's time to hatch them. And when she hatches them, the pro this is the process. Just on this um, card, I've got the... Uh, the life cycle. So this represents the mother crab. Out of her egg, she lays this little thing hatches. It's about a millimetre and a half long, so it's very small. And you can see it's hopefully that it's uh, covered in a sort of um, film and has these tassels at the end. Uh, but after about half an hour, it breaks out of this cuticle, out of this uh, stuff on the outside, and becomes the first zoea larva. And the, the zoea larva swims up into the plankton. Now the plankton, of course, is the animal, are the animals and plants that um, live in the surface layers of the sea. And the reason that, the basic reason it goes up there is because it, um, it is after the food that's there. There are single-celled uh, uh, um, algae that bloom in the surface of the sea, and a whole lot of animals actually take advantage of that. So the larvae of crabs and lobsters do the same. So this little larva here, which is still only about um, two millimetres long, it eats and eats and eats and it finally molts. It'll eat anything it's smaller than a, it'll have a go at anything smaller than an oil tanker. They're amazing. They eat each other. They're, they're fierce eaters. It molts, that is, gets rid of its outer skeleton and gets a little bit larger and so it becomes the second zoea. And in, this, in the case of this Peron's spider crab, after that stage it, it um, metamorphoses or molts into this animal here and you can see now that this actually is like a combination crab, it has all, its, all the legs it's going to have as a crab and it has a tail as well. Underneath that tail it has some paddles which means it can swim. That animal is still out in the plankton but once it becomes that it has the job of getting back to the shore to settle down where the adults live and then it molts into a first little tiny crab. So that's the process that's followed. So that's incredible then, actually. They don't hatch out like fully formed baby little crabs that go Nothing like find at all. a cell, mm. a shell, sorry. Mm. They have to go through these various stages where yes, they're quite they voracious predators. Yes. But also what's quite impressive are those drawings. So as part of your work, you study the larvae. Do you have to draw those? And if so, how do you do it? You don't have to draw them. I mean, that's a, but it's a fairly traditional thing to do. But that's mm. one of the things I also actually enjoy doing when I'm doing my uh, studies is doing the drawings. With those drawings, once they're done, we, um, they, they get uh, published in a scientific journal mm -hmm. and they're there hopefully will help people who catch them in the plankton to actually identify what species they are. I see. So, so that's the purpose of, of, of doing this work, yes. And being so different, of course, in some cases you can never be totally sure that they belong to a particular species unless you study them and make sure you know who they belong to. I see, that makes very much sense, thank you. And very briefly, I think, because we're running out of time for this section, Tapapa has a lot of crustacean specimens in our collections. What do we use those for? They, well, the specimens that we keep, we do have thousands of them, and uh, we collect them over time, we collect them in different places and so on. Uh, what they become is a very uh, useful reference library, because as we keep collecting them, so we compare what we collect to what's in, this, in the collections, Sometimes we find there's something that is entirely different, so new species. 
sometimes we find there's a new species to, to New Zealand, but not one, but one that's already known overseas. And we know then we've got an invader of some kind, one, something that's been introduced. And uh, in, in amongst the crabs that I have here, it, it's a quite a good case of an invader that uh, we've identified and since added to the collection. Here's, an, here's the native paddle crab. That'll be familiar to many people. Paddle crabs have paddles on their last hind leg. These live on all the open sandy beaches of New Zealand from north to south. They're very common. They sometimes turn up in supermarkets for people to um, eat. T uh, in 2000, which was about thir 13 years ago, a fisherman sent me a specimen of this species, and it's also a paddle crab, but it was obviously different. Um, and one of the ways we tell the difference is that we've got five spines there and six along that same equivalent area of that. Anyway, these things um, were tangling up in his nets, making fishing very difficult. We thought they belonged to the Asian paddle crab. We thought that was the identity of them, but we still had to check it. So we checked it. We checked its physical characters, and we checked its. We also checked its. Um, DNA, and then we published a paper on that just to record the fact that it had, had invaded New Zealand. And in fact, that crab is still with us in Auckland Harbour, in Waitemata Harbour, and also harbours up the east coast of Northland up to about Whangarei. So it looks as though it's actually here to stay. So that's a really good example then of how Te Papa can use their collections mm. to tell mm. the difference mm. between an invasive species and one that is native to New Zealand. Now, I think we might have run out of time to expand on that story right. further, but I'm sure you can write an interesting blog on our blog for us about that. I because shall. before we move on to the next section, we've had actually some questions in from members of the public. Right, yes. So I'd like you step this way with me mm -hmm. back to the middle, and I'll just pick up this handy diagram that I printed out earlier. Right, you are. So from John Terry in Carpety, I believe, he sent us this photo. Uh, now, I'm not sure if our cameraman can see this. Yes, it's looking like he can. And John Terry found an example of these on the coast of Carpety, and he wanted to know if you could identify them. Well, I do believe I think I know what it is, and it's called Pyrosoma. It's, it's, I don't know its species name, but that's its genus name. John, I think John Terry, he said it was, um, he thought it might be a holothurian. A holothurian is another one of the echinoderms. So it's not a holothurian. I thought he might be right too, but I asked other people, including somebody in the Smithsonian who's an expert on holothurians. Anyway, we came to the conclusion that it be probably belongs to Pyrosoma. Pyrosoma is a different phylum altogether, which we haven't mentioned before. Um, it, it's called, the, they're called tunicates. They mo most of them live pelagically in the ocean, that is they live near or just below the surface and swim around. Pyrosoma, that pyrosoma there is a colony. Again, it's a little bit like the bryozoans. There are lots of small zooids, so-called, in there, and they make up, they all cling together and make up this tube. On the inside of the, it's a little bit like a jet engine. On the inside, it's, these things have hairs that are in, on the inner side, and they all beat in unison and drive it along slowly, not quite as quick as a jet, of course, but also they process the water and get their food from it and so on. So it's a pyro pyrosoma. A nice thing about these things is they, uh, and they're called pyrosoma. Pyrosoma means fire body, and that's because at night they have bioluminescence. They light up like lamps, really, and if there are millions of them in the water, they put on quite a show. It needs to be fairly calm to see that effect, but that actually happens here and everywhere else in the world where you find them. Oh, thank you, Rick. I hope, John, that answers your question. And just very quickly, we had one more question sent in earlier this week from Liggs, and this might be quite useful to a lot of people on their holidays. So, blue bottles, you see them washed up at the beach quite a lot. Are they still, will they still sting? I think that's what Liggs wanted to know. Yes, they will, if they're fresh enough. If they're wet or look wet and they're still a bit flexible, it's very likely they will sting. They sting with tiny little cells, and they, the little cells actually have a physical trigger on the outside, too small to see with your eye. But if you trigger that trigger and they still have the pressure inside them, which is incredibly high, they will fire and go into your skin. But once they're dried out, no. They, there, there comes a time when those won't work anymore. Just when that is... I'd have to leave it to Lex to actually work that one out. Keeping his shoes on, hopefully, <laughs> if he's going to step on them, because he did mention that, the possibility of stepping mm -hmm. on Yeah, you can. 
probably what is more interesting or more useful to look at is to see if it has long little blue threads coming out of it because those are the threads that have the stings in rather than the float itself. That's great. Thanks, Rick. And Liggs, I hope that answers your question. So just bear in mind, do be a bit wary if you see any blue bottles on the beach. They can still sting. So thanks very much, Rick. We'll say goodbye to him now and hand back over to Scott, who I believe is going to be talking not about animals you can find at the beach, but instead about seaweeds. Yeah, that's right, Ruth. Thank you. Um, Rick has mentioned that seaweed forests are um, a habitat that support a huge diversity of life. Um, and I'm very interested to learn a lot more about this environment. So luckily uh, with me, I've got Jen Dalen, Papa scientist and manager of our natural environment collections. Um, welcome along, Jen. Um, come on in this way a bit more. Um, so first of all, can you tell us what is a seaweed? Uh, good question. I think you actually called them plants, and they're actually not plants at all. Um, seaweeds are actually algae, and I think when people think of algae, they think of you know pond scum or slime in your fish tank, and actually seaweeds are algae as well. Um, they're marine, and they're actually macroalgae, so big things that we can see. Yeah, I know algae is what I, th I think of pond scum when I think of algae, but seaweed is also an algae. Yeah. Um, so could you tell us and our viewers what is the difference between a plant and an algae then? Uh, good question. So um, I guess it basically comes down to how they're constructed. So you can think of plants as having, you know, they're more complex. They've got uh, differentiated tissues. They've got roots. They've got flowers. They've got structures that are just a bit more complex, uh, whereas um, algae tend to be simpler. I mean, not to say they're not as interesting, but they're just more simple and they reproduce by spores. Um, but like plants, actually, they photosynthesize and they produce oxygen. And I think one of the big things that people don't realize is algae produce half of the oxygen on Earth. So half the oxygen we breathe comes from algae. Wow, so um, algae and, and seaweeds are, are very important to our survival. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, they're, they're also similar in the sense that they're, I mean, they're, they form the forests of our oceans. So, you know, not just being a primary producer, they also form the habitat and food and, you know, the environment for marine organisms to thrive in. So. Indeed. Um, and we heard from Rick, he was telling us about different groups of marine um, animals and animals we'll find near the seashore. Um, can we group seaweed in a similar way? Do we have groups of seaweed? Oh, absolutely. Um, in effect, it's all quite complicated. But uh, one nice thing is there's actually a really broad way to um, group seaweeds, big, you know, broadly classifying them. Um, and there's three groups. There's green, brown and red algae. And you can actually see any of those groups if you go to the beach. And so... Um, Today I've actually brought in some fresh seaweed and I've started to sort them already into their colour groups. So we've got a tray here of green seaweed and brown seaweed and red seaweed. Um, and I've actually brought you a little, a little test tray too, to see if whether or not you can kind of match up the colours. So really the differences between the groups are um, based on their pigments. So you, they may all kind of look the same on the shore, but you can actually kind of, if you take a closer look, you can probably start to see these differences. Okay, so you've got a tray here with three different seaweeds, so I'm trying to go red, green and brown. I can go with the easy one first. That looks green to me, is that alright? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll put that one over there. It's a bit like grapes even, eh? It does look a bit like grapes. Um, I'd say that one's a red one, yep. so I'll put that with the red seaweed over there. And that leaves us with uh, this one here, which must be a brown seaweed. Yep. good work. <laughs> And in some ways, that seems quite easy. It's obviously not all that cut and dry, but it's, you know, <coughs> as a basic way of classifying, there's certainly, um, yeah, the pigments are different between the groups consistently. So we've got green, brown, and red just here. I can see, just looking at them, within the groups of colours, there's still quite a lot of variation between the types of seaweed. Mm. So can you tell us a bit more about the different types of seaweed within these groups? Absolutely. Um, actually, why don't we start down here with the green one? So these are just a few examples of, of seaweeds you'd find, you know, in the common part of the intertidal, just here on Wellington's coast. So um, over here we've got a tray of green stuff. So you can actually, most people can pick up sea, uh, sea lettuce quite easily because it's always sort of bright and vivid green. And we've actually got two species of um, calerpa here. And they're, um, yeah, that one, that one actually commonly is called sea, sea grapes as well. So again, you can kind of pick, pick it up because they often are quite vibrant. And this one here is called Codium, and I actually really like that one because it's quite, um, you wouldn't think of it as being a seaweed. It's often velvety and kind of wrinkly on the rocks. And what's neat about it is that it's actually kind of almost all one cell. So it's, it's got a, an interesting structure. It's siphonous, and so it doesn't actually, you know, it's actually quite a simple organism, yet can look so interesting on rocks. So. 
Yeah, indeed. So this this is one one cell, the whole. Basically, yeah, kind of not to say you know per plant, I guess I shouldn't call it a plant per yeah per seaweed, I guess. So it's kind of I've kind of pulled a bunch off the rocks like that. So kind of got an interesting an interesting way it grows. Oh, amazing. I always thought cells were tiny, tiny little things. So there we go. I've learned something new about cells as well as seaweed. We Can we have a look at the brown stuff now? Yeah, yeah. So these are, these are good. So you've just thrown that one on there. That's, that one's actually quite a neat one because it's all, got all these little fuzzy um, proliferations on the blades. But um, I'll start with this big one over here. So we've got, this is actually um, an undaria and it's a kelp. And so you can actually see, this is a good one to kind of see the, the structure of a, of a more... Um, differentiated kelp, I guess. I don't know what the right word is there, but um, this is great because you can actually see the hold fast, which actually you can see why it looks a little bit like roots, but it, with a seaweed, it's actually just holding the seaweed to the rock. It's not actually working like a root. Um, and then it turns into the stipe, and you'd actually call this the midrib, but it kind of functions like a stem in a land plant. And then, of course, this is the blady bit, so kind of like leaves, really. So. Um, and this one, I think I've just said, is Undaria, and it's interesting as well because it's actually an introduced species, so it's actually a weed on our coast, but you pretty much could see it anywhere, so it's often something common that people will spot because it's often washed up on the shore, and it's actually quite dominant in a lot of places. So, yeah. And there's okay. actually some other brown, um, brown seaweeds here, and I just I always like looking at some, you know, kind of the interesting ways that seaweeds have adapted to their environment. So all of these species here you would find um, commonly in the intertidal. They all have kind of different ways for coping. It's quite a harsh environment being on the shore, exposed at, at low tide and whatnot. So we've got ones with little tubes that hold water. Um, Hormocyra is quite common. Everyone probably recognizes that one. And um, this little one here is Leothesia. And I like it because it looks kind of like a brain on the beach. So it kind of fills up with water and you could almost, you know, step on it and it squirts out. But um, yeah, so those are some examples of brown. And then we've got our tray of reds. And I have to say reds are my favorite just <coughs> because there's, there's so many different species and they're actually really, they can be really beautiful. And I don't think people quite appreciate the diversity of their morphologies. And so there's things all the way from little feathery ones like this, where it's pressed down to sort of like a rubbery blade and all the way to this, this stuff on here which is actually a seaweed. So it looks just like pink paint on rock and it's actually a red, a red alga. So I don't know, it's kind of just the range of everything to me is just amazing. So, and the other thing about um, the pink paint is quite an interesting one too, because I don't think most people wouldn't even think of it as being a seaweed. And it, it's actually quite an important part of our ecosystem. The reason why it looks all crusty and crunchy is that it's, um, that type of seaweed has taken calcium carbonate from the water. It's almost like chalk, and it's kind of that's what enables that sort of structure. So in a reef system, you can imagine it's almost like cement. It's you know it helps to kind of form form up the reef. So it's really quite an important seaweed in our environment. Oh, fascinating. So just a small selection of seaweeds here, and one that looks like paint. I mean, I'm sure I would have walked past that on a beach many times and just assumed it was a coloured rock. Mm. So um, I'll keep my eye out for that from now on. Sure. Um, just in the small selection here, I mean, it's quite a, a range of seaweeds. Can, can you tell us how many seaweeds we, we know of? Yeah, that's a great question because <clears throat> the answer is we don't actually really know. So um, in New Zealand, we think there's probably about a thousand different species and only about 800 of them have been formally described and have, you know, proper names from scientists. So there's actually, you know, close to, we could say 200 uh, seaweed species that don't actually have names yet. So to me, that's quite amazing that, I don't know, there's just so much to be done, actually. So, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, 200 species still without names, so there's still some, some work to be done. Yeah, for sure. It's, there's just heaps to do. And in fact, even things that we thought we knew change all the time. Even about a year ago, a big bull kelp species was just described. And to me, that's just, it's amazing that something that big we're still learning so much about and trying to figure out what's what. And it, when you think about it that way, you can imagine how much more else we don't know. So it's actually quite astonishing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Now, earlier, we, you, some of the names I picked up, there was sea, sea lettuce, and we had sea grapes as well. These are kind of names reminding me of, of, of land plants and, and yeah. food that we eat. Um, <clears throat> can, we, can we eat seaweed? For sure, yep. Um, and lots of people do. And probably the most famous seaweed that we all eat is the seaweed that's wrapped around our sushi. And so I don't actually have any with me today, but um, the nori that's around 
um, sushi is actually a red seaweed. So by the time you dry it and process it, it actually looks a bit black. But um, it's actually been quite a well-studied seaweed too, which is interesting because I think the wide use and the wide application of it. And so in New Zealand, for example, we have um, what was once thought to believe um, be believed to be one species is actually now quite a lot. And Tapapa, for example, has a great you know collection of those seaweeds to sort of you know it's the the work of people working for a long time to look at that type of seaweed. We've got collections of as well. So. Oh, good. So we can we know we can eat one type around our sushi. Um, is that the only type that people eat, or do we use seaweed in other foods as well? Well, I think I think in other places seaweed's considered you know it's a highly valued food item in a lot of different places. There's you know it's known to be quite nutritious, and I think in in some countries and places for sure it would be something that you have on the menu. But I think for um, you know, people like us, we probably don't realize we actually all use and eat seaweed in our day, day to day. Um, and we've actually, one of the things probably most commonly that, that is, one of the most common ways that, our, that things are in our food is actually through some of the extracts from these rubbery red seaweeds. So the, the gels and slimes that make these red seaweeds be able to be in the intertidal are actually extracted out of the red seaweeds and put into a lot of food products. And so, um, I, give, I always give the example to my kids of chocolate milk. So if you buy a, um, chocolate milk from the shop, it always looks nice and creamy and thick. And if you try to make your glass of chocolate milk at home, the, the particles actually sort of fall out as you try to stir it up. And the one from the shop is the way it is because um, it's got a seaweed extract in it to keep it thick and smooth. So, ah, so it's very useful in making, in making chocolate milk as well. Yeah, um, so I possibly drank seaweed this morning for breakfast. You could have, yeah. <laughs> sure. All right. Thank you very much, Jen. Um, I know I've learned a lot about seaweed. Um, I'm sure I'll keep a closer eye out and look at it more closely next time I'm at the beach. Great. Thank you. Hey, Scott, that was really great. Thank you. I particularly like the pink crusty rock. I would have never, ever picked that for a seaweed if I was walking along. Definitely not. So this is a coastal <coughs> science book that Tepepa has recently published. And books like these have lots of illustrations and diagrams and pictures, really beautiful pictures, and lots of information in. And if you are out and about on the beach or on the coast, you can use books like these, like a scientist would use their collections. So you can use them to identify species, to work out exactly what you're say, seeing, to find out a little bit more information about it. And this is how a scientist would use their collections. They'd take new specimens that they found at a beach, take it back, compare them to existing collection items and use that to find out a little bit more information. Now, before we go on to the next segment, I actually had a question in from Sarah and she wants to know what the largest New Zealand crustacean is or the largest crustacean in New Zealand waters. And I had a quick chat to Rick off camera and asked him and Rick has kindly said the largest one in kind of leg span is the New Zealand king crab, uh, Lithoides aotearoa points for my Latin prince names in there, <laughs> I think. And that's 1.2 metre leg span. But the heaviest is the pack horse rock, lab, rock lobster, which is seven to eight kilos, which is pretty impressive for a lobster, I think. That is indeed a very heavy lobster and a very large crab, 1.2 <laughs> metres across. That's quite scary. <laughs> that's right. So I think now you'll be speaking to Susan, who's going to be telling us a little bit more about the birds we can find at the coast. So I'll leave you to that one and catch you later. That's right. Thank you, Ruth. Um, yes, yeah, so we're going to be learning now about birds. Um, we've learned, um, we've looked at seaweed, we've looked at um, other animals you'll find at the seashore. And with me now is Susan Waugh, our head science curator and um, expert in sea, seabird foraging, to tell us a bit more about some of the birds that we'll see at the seashore. Thanks, Scott. Um, so first of all, Susan, can you um, tell us just a little bit about what you do here at Te Papa? Sure. Um, well, I work on a whole range of um, natural history topics and science topics more generally, and um, I also um, help put exhibitions together and write science papers, and then I get some time to do field work each year and uh, work on seabirds when I get that opportunity. And, um, I know you're quite, quite lucky that you do get to spend some time out in the field, um, not just in New Zealand, but overseas as well, looking at birds. Yeah, that's right. Some of the species I work on um, nest only on offshore <coughs> islands. And um, so this summer I'm going to be going to Coromandel and spending time on a really small island there studying fleshwooded shearwaters just outside of Fitianga. Oh, fascinating. It sounds like a great way to, to see the world. Yeah. Um, so we've learned about the diversity of all the different sea creatures so far. I'm going to assume that there's an equal diversity of birds as well. And we've got quite a, a, quite a, a wide diversity of birds on our seashore. 
Yeah, New Zealand has got a huge diversity of birds, um, particularly in the marine areas and coastal areas. We've got around 100 species that occur regularly here, and that's around a third of the world's seabirds. Um, and we've got more seabirds around New Zealand's coast than any other country does. Okay, so I can see you've brought in a big selection over here. You might be able to take us through some of, some of these birds to start with. Sure. So we brought in some birds from the collections that are coastal species and so we're going to walk through um, what some of these are and how people can um, start studying them and identifying them for themselves. Okay, great. So um, if we're out at the, at the seashore looking at birds, what kind of things would we be looking for when we're trying to identify birds? Well, one of the first things that um, you'll notice when you look at the birds is about their size. So, for example, the shag that we've got here is one of our biggest species that's common at the coast. Um, and it's a lot bigger than the gulls here. And so we've got um, two different colours or two different plumage patterns for um, black-back gulls, which is the bigger of the gulls in, in New Zealand area. This is a, a young bird, so less than a year old, and it's got this mottled pattern. Those ones are really common um, all around the coast, and you'll probably see them at rubbish dumps and places like that. They're very um, effective scavengers. But the adults look like this with much more um, defined black and white plumage and a stripy wing on them when their wings are folded, a bright yellow bill. But another gull that we have um, is the red-billed gull, and um, that one occurs in New Zealand and Australia. So you can see it's a much smaller bird um, and a really delicate grey plumage on it. A third species, and, a, and, a, and again a smaller one, is um, the white-fronted tern. So when you see terns um, at the coast, um, we have quite a few in New Zealand, a few um, dozen of them. And um, they've got different coloured bills, different coloured feet, and some of them have um, more or less white on the front of their um, foreheads like this. Quite hard to tell apart from each other. But you can easily tell the difference between a tern and the gull um, by looking at their size to start with. So when I look at birds um, from far away, I'm trying to work out in initially how big they are and I try and compare them with, say, a pigeon or with, I don't know, a cat or a dog or some animal I'm familiar with. That way, even if they're far away, you can still um, get an idea about the size and that helps you categorise them. Another common coastal species we have right around New Zealand is the um, blue penguin or the little blue penguin or fairy penguin as they're called in Australia. And these occur um, all the way around our coast and um, they mainly um, nest or um, spend their day hiding in the bushes just off the beach. And these guys are really vulnerable to being attacked by dogs or being disturbed by people. So we have to take care of them and make sure that we keep our dogs on a lead if they're at the beach, even though it's fun for your dog to run around. But it's great also to have wildlife on our beaches um, and know that we're looking after nature properly. Excellent. So yeah, quite a, just in a small sample here, we've got quite a, a good diversity in, of birds and I'm sure there's lots more that we'll see at the seashore. So if you're out studying birds and you spot a bird, um, you've kind of take a quick note of the size of that bird, um, where do you go to from there? Sure, well um, I, when I'm out in the field I often have a scrap of paper in my pocket and a pencil and um, when I'm out doing work um, for my job I usually have a, a, note, a notebook and normally a waterproof notebook if I'm studying seabirds because there's often raining or there's water around. Um, so I will make a quick sketch and here I brought in one of my notebooks from a couple of years ago where I saw a bird flying past and I thought gosh that's really unusual and I made a quick sketch of it. And so you can see I've drawn a little sort of silhouette of this bird flying by and it turned out, um, this was in French Polynesia, this turned out to be a new record of that species for um, the island that we were at. It was a phoenix petrel, so we thought maybe they'd be in the region but we weren't really sure. And um, thanks to this drawing and the fact we saw it flying past a couple more times, we were able to um, confirm its identity and create a new record and, and um, um, tell the science public and, and, and specialists that we, this bird was found much further east than we thought it had been previously. Also turned out to be a very important sketch. So I can imagine if you're sketching birds, you have to be quite quick to draw your bird before it flies away. Um, can you give us a quick demonstration of how you might quickly draw a bird? Sure, so if I'm going to try and um, uh, figure out what kind of bird I'm dealing with, um, I'll just have a a really good hard look at it and then I'll try and work out what were the key features so I'm just going to try and draw you a couple now. So for example if I've seen the shag that we're looking at there then I would have noted that it had a really long hooky beak. I'm not quite up to Rick's um, drawing skills here but then it's got a really snaky neck like this and then quite a large body a sticky out tail and I've also noticed that it's got webbed feet that's a really important thing to notice whether their feet are webbed or not. And then I'll try and describe how much black or white it might have on its body because that's another thing when you're thinking about 
these species is actually where the colour patterns are on them. So you can see that's a sort of silhouette shape. Is there a lie there? So I can see that the really key characteristics, lots of black on the tail and back, white hair and long snaky neck. And that's quite different from, say, if I saw one of the other birds on the table there, like the oyster catchers that are on the end of the table. They've got really long toes. This looks like a sort of mutant kiwi today, doesn't it? <laughs> mutant toes. And they've got um, a long, quite a long tail on them, but they've got quite a kind of comp compact body. They don't have this long snaky neck like these guys do. So even a drawing like that would help me work out what my, my bird is. You don't have to be an expert. <laughs> oh, that gives me hope yet. I'm not the world's best drawer either. Um, so you've drawn your bird. You're trying to take idea of, of key features. Um, why is it important to figure out which, which species of bird it actually is? Well, we really need to understand um, which species it is if we're going to try and understand anything about the bird's lifestyle, what kinds of things it um, eats or where it lives, and um, also whether we're looking at something unusual or not. So trying to um, figure out exactly which of the gulls it is that I'm looking at or the many different shags we have in New Zealand um, helps me understand... Um, yeah, is this a really rare, important sighting, or is this? Um, am I looking at a whole colony of the same kind of bird? That kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if I'm out looking at birds this summer and I'm drawing some pictures, is it likely that I'll discover a new bird myself? Um, probably not for birds because they're actually quite well known. Um, there are around 10,000 bird species known um, globally, and I think most of the discoveries have already been done um, and that's partly because they're really obvious when we're out walking we can notice birds easily and people are very attracted to them and have done a lot of effort. A lot of people are really interested in birds. Um, so in terms of new species probably not um, but in, certainly in terms of new records and um, the science community are really interested to hear from people if they think they've got something unusual that they've seen um, and we can, there's a good resource online that Te Papa scientists have helped um, put together over the last year or two and that's at a website site called New Zealand Birds Online, so nzbirdsonline.org.nz and it's got a great um, tool to help you identify what bird you're looking at that uses photos and silhouettes to help you figure out which group of birds and down right down to the species. Oh, excellent, so I might have to check that out later too. Right, and um, I wanted to talk to you about uh, a group of birds in particular which we often find at the coast and that's these folks here. This little group of oyster catchers. So oyster catchers are very characteristic. They've got um, really bright red legs and they've got um, a bright red bill on them and they're quite noisy as well when we're at the beach. And um, so um, what I wanted to show you was um, that we're still figuring out new species and um, the most recent of these was discovered in 1927 or described in 1927. So here we've got the variable oyster catcher which is all black and or it can come in this black and white um, format here. And um, this was one of the very first birds ever described for New Zealand. So in 1769, um, on Captain Cook's first visit to New Zealand, they, they talked about this black bird here. Um, and I think they probably ate a few by the sound of the record that they put on there. Um, and it took scientists about another 50 years to work out the difference between the black and white version of it and this one here, which is a South Island pied oyster catcher. These ones are a little bit heavier and um, have shorter legs and they're a chunkier looking bird but um, there's several slight differences between them these guys have slightly longer legs and the line between the black and white on the belly between this one and the pied version of the variable um, is much more smudgy here and much more distinct here and then there's a third species that we have in New Zealand the Chatham Island oyster catcher which is somewhere in between these two and that was um, first described in 1927 and so Te Papa's collections are used a lot for these kind of species by species um, differentiations. And Te Papa scientists have actually contributed to describing the most recent um, two species that have been um, identified to science in New Zealand. So one of them is um, a new species of snipe that was discovered in the, in the Campbell Islands. And, and then a species of kiwi that was um, described from among the kiwi that occur in south southern part of Westland, um, the rowie. So that was only described about um, 10 years ago. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, so uh, thank you very much for, for joining us today, Susan. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up there. We're coming close to the end of our, of our broadcast. Um, I know I'll be taking a much closer look at birds when I'm at the beach this summer as well. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Scott. Oh, thanks, Scott. It was really interesting to hear Susan and also Jen talk about their 
areas of interest, and in particular Rick as well, with the invertebrates. But that's all we've got time for, for this Science Live. We'll be coming back to you probably in March next year, we think. So stay tuned for that. Remember, science is always happening at Tapapa, so you can continue to follow the scientists at our blog, which is blog.tapapa.govt.nz. And you can always, of course, come into the museum and see the science exhibits we've got here. That's right. You can um, see lots of these, um, these birds on display or ones very similar to them. That's right. So thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you, hopefully, in March. Thank you, and goodbye.